So I thought I'd share this one and a few thoughts. So this is actually, this was not part of my uh, single layer test. This is actually two layers. And so I did it on the fine setting. Uh, so it's point 0.2, then point 0.1. Just because I wanted the more... Uh, you, you get creases on the, even like the perfect single layer, you get some creases if you bend it. But this way, they're sort of opposing uh, grains, right? Um, now, a couple things I noticed. Uh, you can see here, the slicer's been doing something weird. Ever since I changed the, which setting? I don't know if it was the, no, you know what it was? When I switched... Huh, now, now I'm confused because I was going to say it was when I first switched to 0.3 millimeter first layer height instead of 0.2 millimeter first layer height. Uh, it kind of did this little layer shift thing. And I, you can see the border. There's a space between the border and the rest of the print. And that sort of confused me. Um, and I didn't show it like that in the slice preview. And uh, it was consistent. Uh, across a couple prints that I did with the uh, 0.3 millimeter first layer, which does actually does uh, that, that was a pretty good uh, way to get a pretty solid first layer. But it's kind of nice to have a thin first layer too if you want something sort of transparent. But uh, in any case, so yeah, the slicer seems to have a little bit of a bug as far as shifting the layers. And I actually um, one thing I did on this the model is actually 220 by 220, and I scaled it by. 99 percent um just to clear the purge line there um and that didn't change i thought it might change the slice weirdness too and it did not um so definitely not a big deal i mean when would you ever print a full sheet like this other than for testing so it's really not a big deal at all but this is actually really nice but i see the one imperfection there and i'm pretty sure i know what that is and i forgot that i need to take this hot end apart uh, the uh, print head uh, hot end well the print head because it's the hot end and the cold end but anyway i need to uh try again at sealing the the nozzle to the heat break because that that i believe is a booger that oozed out from the top of the nozzle at the heat break gap where there's not supposed to be a gap and so when I fixed it last time, I didn't take it apart. I just kind of tried to, while it was still in there, loosen the set screw for the heat break and and then sort of rotate the whole thing one direction, the appropriate direction for this. I don't want to say which direction because I'll get it backwards. <laughs> and then loosen the nozzle, then use the set screw to tighten the heat break into the heater block a little bit and then tighten the set screw again, and then um, and then tighten the nozzle back up against the heat break. And so that's not really the right way to do it because you can't really tell if you're doing it right or not. But the reason I did that is because I was afraid of the, one of the screws to the that hold the holds the holds the heat sink uh, the heater block into the heat sink. One of those screws was making me nervous because I had a hard time getting the little hex key in there and getting a grip. But but once I, and then I realized after the once I heated it up and it wasn't a big surprise. I've seen this many times. Uh, once I heated it up and, and there was obviously a little bit of plastic melted into the head of the screw, and then the hex key went in there, no problem. So it's not really not a problem. So I just need to re uh, reset that, eliminate that gap, and it should be fine. Assuming the end of the heat break and the end of the nozzle are both uh, square and flat then it's just a matter of tightening them against each other and then that should not be an issue again uh, I mean unless it you know came loose or something but I'm not sure what this one is well anyway so the so when that blob came down I'm sure there was a little bit of a string and so that this string ended up messing things up and it's probably the same thing over here but really the quality other than that it was funny when I was monitoring it lot when monitoring it remotely, I I didn't realize that that's what those imperfections were from, and I was asking myself what would cause those imperfections if the, if everything is, you know, the diameter is filament diameter is consistent, and obviously the nozzle diameter is not going to change, and and the, the extrusion rate and blah blah blah, and everything's uh, you know, CNC, so it shouldn't have imperfections. Uh, 
Uh, again, my camera stopped me at five minutes, and who knows what I what I was saying that didn't get recorded. But so looking at the back, uh, it looks very good. I can kind of see lines here. Um, that's pretty normal. And here, there's actually no lines. But uh, I mean, it's really it's really good. I mean, you really have to look closely to see anything other than perfection. Like I say, the the this this over here is just that I need to tighten up my nozzle to my heat break. So anyway, I've probably had about enough of messing with these uh, full uh, full layer testing prints. But I really just wanted to nail down. Uh, you know, can I? be confident that I'm getting the proper amount of extrusion and my bed leveling and my calibration. And so to reiterate, it's actually a good idea to, so to reiterate what I, what I've done over the past two days in order to greatly improve my single layer testing is first is first and foremost is, uh, the keep, make sure there's not a, a little dimple of plastic up in the nozzle. Because if there's a little bit too much plastic up in the nozzle, and then you go to do a calibration, and my my theory is, is that yeah, it's going to put it at some temperature, and then it's going to push down on the bed. And the way the bed level, <clears throat> the way the bed leveling works is I, I I'm convinced as just from looking at it, is there's four load cells. I'm pretty sure they're piezoelectric. Well, I need a drink. Um, it's four load cells, and so when the nozzle pushes on on them. On the bed, the load sig cells signal that uh, that a very light load is pushed on the bed, and piezo is really good at that. If you don't know about piezo, uh, go, uh, check it out, uh, search about it. Uh, P i e z o, and they use them for. You can use them both directions. You can use them to generate power, or you could also use also. Uh, you can use them to generate very. I said that wrong. You, you can use them to generate very low voltage, like like I don't know millivolts, microvolts. I don't know how low it is. Um, but so if you just squeeze on the piece of ceramic, it generates a voltage. And if you hold it, the voltage, you know, the, the squeezing, it's just like a dit. Like if you did it on a graph, it would just be like a spike of voltage. And if you hold it, it's back to zero. And then if you let it go, it'll spike the other way. Uh, you know, spike negative and then go back to zero. I, I believe somebody corrects me if I'm wrong on that. I believe that's how it works. And uh, in my experience, a little bit of professional experience with that. Uh, and then you can also use them to actuate things. They use them for precise actuation. They use them to like align laser mirrors and things like that. Um, and they also use them in, uh, you might have seen piezo tweeters, like a, a sort of higher end uh, speaker tweeter, you know, audio speaker tweeter. Um, it, uh, well, I shouldn't say the necessarily higher end. I don't really know. I'm sort of making stuff up right there. I don't, I don't know that much about piezo tweeters other than they use piezos to make tweeters sometimes. But point is, this uses piezos, I believe, from what from looking at it myself, from inspecting it. looks to me like they're piezo-actuated um, load cells. And so when you push down with the printhead on the bed, it, it sends a little voltage blip. And to say, okay, it's pushing on the bed, and then it stops. But if you have a little piece of plastic stuck to the tip, and then it pushes on it, even if it's up to temperature, it's going to push on it, and the plastic's going to give a little bit, and then it's going to register that, that it pushed, and then so it's going to lift back up, and then it's going to move to the next spot, and then when it goes to push down again, if the plastic's a little more squished than it was last time, it's going to squish again, and it's going to so it's going to progressively squish the plastic a little more, and it's going to gradually give you a not flat readout, or, you know, a... a an exaggerated, or not not exaggerated. It's going to give you uh, the mesh that it generates is not going to be a, a parallel offset of the bed surface by a slight amount because of basically that. So I, I bring the temperature of the nozzle up to 175. If I really want a good print, and actually I do this before the calibration first of all, but I'll do even do it before a print on one of these prints. I'll bring it up to 175 if a PLA. I find that's a good number, softens it up good, and I'll clean it off with a little piece of uh, Scotch Brite pad. And then I'll run my print, and that way I know there's no plastic in the way. And uh, and then the and then the other thing to tune. So that that gave me super consistent uh, bad prints. <laughs> but so then what you have to do from there is tune in your flow rates in your Z offset. And so the Z offset is in the experimental settings in Creality Print Slicer, and the flow rate I'm not sure where that is, but there's a first layer of flow rate setting that you can also do. So all right, thanks for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, share, all that stuff. Have a good one.